Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Goreski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those who might be new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we are all about bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. If you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find a whole series of events uh, for classrooms to join, either in-camera spots or live uh, via the YouTube streams. So this month has been a pretty awesome month. We've been bouncing all over the world, uh, celebrating conservation. So talking to scientists, to explorers, to conservationists who have dedicated their life to protecting uh, ecosystems as well as the species found within. So if you head over to the website, you can find a ton uh, more events coming up. Today though, we're heading out into the field and we are connecting with OSA Conservation. So we love our events with OSA Conservation where we head down to the rainforest uh, in Costa Rica and learn about all the incredible uh, conservation work they do. We're going to connect with Andy Whitworth today. He is a wildlife conservationist, National Geographic Explorer, and Director of Ecological Restoration and Biodiversity Conservation uh, at OSA Conservation. We're joining their team for a pretty special event. They are trialing different ways to restore and rewild uh, missing pieces of rainforest ecosystems. So this work they're doing is going to help guide best practices for tropical forest uh, restoration around the world. So let me bring Andy in here live with us. Andy, how are you doing today? How are you doing, Joe? Good to be with you. All right. Andy, always great to see you. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before the call. It was raining this morning. It's rainy season right now, but it seems like the sky's cleared for us for our live event today. Yeah, it's pretty cloudy, but, uh, you know, we're recovering from the, uh, the, the hurricane earlier this week. But, uh, no, it dried up nicely just for us, I think, this morning. All right. Awesome. Well, Andy, I'm going to let you take over for a bit. I know you're going to introduce us to some incredible members of your team. Uh, we're looking forward to it this morning. Awesome. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so we're going to meet um, a, a bunch of people this morning who were right on the front line of restoration uh, and what we call rewilding. So we're going to tell you a little bit more about what that means. And, and these guys are kind of living and breathing this stuff out in the field. And they're trying to understand how we bring ecosystems back, and in particular, rainforest ecosystems. But not just the, when we say ecosystem, what we mean is the trees, the plants, and then all the wildlife that goes with that. So we want to re restore the ecosystem. So not just planting trees, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that with the team. So let's have a look. You can see right here, I'm in a really open area, and it's just full of this really dense thick grass and this used to be a cattle farm right so this is what's happening in the amazon right now we're converting our rainforests into these kind of cattle pastures where it's just grazed by cows and what we're doing here actually is we took this cattle farm and it's been abandoned now for about seven years and we're trying to look at ways that we can restore it and ways that we can regrow rainforests so we're thinking about a future and what these ecosystems can look like if we want to regrow rainforest. So you can see this place has been abandoned, like I say, for over seven years with no cows on there. And it's still full of this very thick, aggressive grass. And there's very few trees that are actually growing up inside it. There are some trees that are kind of regenerating naturally. I don't know if you can see, not the big ones in the back, they were already there. But there's a couple of little shrubby things growing through. But to be honest, it's pretty slow recovery uh, and it's hard for the trees to establish. And there's a number of reasons why that is. And we're going to learn about that today. Obviously, one of the reasons is that there's no seeds there. There's no seeds from the trees and there's no animals to move those seeds out into the grassland. And if a seed does get there, then it has to compete with that grass in the hot baking sun. So it's a very tricky um process to think about how we can rebuild and regrow these ecosystems. So we're going to start on a little journey today. I'm going to take you through uh, our landscape and we're going to meet some of the dedicated team who works at Osa Conservation and they work on the front line of this restoration. This is what they wake up every day thinking about how they're going to fix the systems that we we've, we've damaged and how we're going to bring back wildlife and regrow these systems. So we're going to meet Maria Jose first. Maria? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? So Maria Jose uh, is from Costa Rica, and she works uh, in this big restoration experiment that she's going to tell us about. I'm going to let you tell her, uh, let her tell us 
what she does on a day-to-day basis and what this whole experiment is about. And so she's going to tell us about some of these trees. So why don't you tell me what you're doing this morning? Yeah, this morning I'm doing uh, a mortality monitoring. So I go check tree by tree, see how well they're doing. Uh, and this big experiment, this very cool experiment that Andy mentioned. Um, so as you can see, maybe some people around, this is okay. the basic um, or classical way of doing restoration or reforestation. And it's about planting hardwoods in rows. Um, and that's diff- very difficult to do. It's not as simple as it might sound. You can see some of these trees are very are tall, but you can see the grass is also very tall. So this was just, the grass was cut um, like maybe a couple of weeks ago. So uh, Maria, how old, how old are these trees? Like, let's take this tree over here, for yeah. example. Let's, let's go and have a look. So you've got a tree here. I don't know what this is. Uh, what, how old is this tree? This is three years old. So three years to get to that a size. Little more than three years. Yeah. Uh, but for this tree to grow, it's called in, in three years. We have to cut the grass like three times a year because the, it's a competition, right? So the, the grasses and other weeds overshadow the tree. So you have to be on top of it. Wait, wait, so you, but how do you cut that? Uh, you just go with a machete and make rounds around it, uh, around each tree. Uh huh. And it looks like the trees got a lot of, uh, um, I mean, what do you call these? Like yeah, lianas like or, or yeah, strangling vines. vines. Exactly. These are like the main issue also because they, these are a little uh, dry because it's there, they've been cut, but they just strangle the trees completely uh, and they can even make them fall. So what do you think about the big tree plant? tree planting projects going on all over the world are they, are they effective is this the right way to regrow um forest and b- rebuild ecosystems well we need to plant trees we know that but we need to think and really try to replicate what goes on goes on in nature so we can like do it strategic, strategically mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah like do it in a smart way so we can be as effective as we can and we cannot just go to the forest and pick some seeds so a very slow growing species and throw it in a field it just needs a little more than that okay so you've got to do a lot of work in terms of um clearing these things and what are you doing with your notebook this morning what's going on i'm um, basically going three by three and writing uh, if it's alive or dead most of these are alive because they're very old now but we have even this at the beginning of this year we planted it in some other plots and uh, so we have to check how we're doing because we're collecting data Mm-hmm. So we can get a sense of what what's the best way, and I'll show you what that is. So this is a big experiment, right, yeah. um, Joe? This is what we should kind of note here, and for everybody listening, we're in right now one little parcel, one little area, and what we've got here are forty half hectare plots, um, and just for scale, it's it's kind of like just over seventy meters by seventy meters, and in each of those plots. We plant around 1,200 trees. No, 1,600, right? Yeah. 1,600 trees. So it's a huge amount of work. You can imagine going around and having to clear by hand with machete every three or four months all of that that area. So that makes tree planting pretty expensive. And if you don't do that, like Maria Jose says, you get a lot of mortality and a lot of the trees get strangled by those vines and they don't survive. And you can see after... So after three years, we've got a pretty small, shrubby kind of forest, right? And lots of grass still on the ground and the trees are struggling. So let's go and look at a little different yeah. part of the experiment. Okay. And we also have to measure some of these trees, right? And we have to really collect that data. And so that's a lot of work also. Mm-hmm. Go in and measure the diameter, the height of the trees. Just collects in the scientific data. Exactly. Uh-huh. So Andy, as we're moving to the and next how often spot. Do you... Oh, uh, sorry, say that again, Joe. I was gonna say, as we're moving to the next spot, I just had a question that came in um, from Cameron here. And they're wondering, um, you know, we saw the trees at, at, th- at uh, three years. Are those trees that are going to be much larger? Are you expecting, you know, those kind of like 70 foot tall trees or higher that you've climbed for us in the past? Yeah, most of these trees, 
you can find them in the forest, deep in the tropical forest, and they can be giant, giant trees. Yeah. So that's the typical approach for a lot of these restoration programs. They'll, they'll usually use some kind of hardwood, like useful tree that comes from a rainforest. And then they kind of sit and cook in the sun for a, a long time. So what we're going to do now, we're at this different area and I just want to spin around and we're going to follow Maria okay. Jose. And we're going to look at a different strategy here for restoration. Look at this. Um, so you can see this looks very different. And this is the key part of this experiment, as we said, an experiment with the data. And it's based on the idea of replicating what happens in nature, not and so what happens usually as after something happens, like a big tree falls down or at the, at the side of the river or the side of the roads, is that pioneer species come first. And these species grow very fast and, and they create this, this space for other species later. The balsa tree is one of these species. And you can see this has the same age as the other trees that I, I showed you before, for three years. How tall is this? <laughs> like six, seven meters? At least, yeah. So now we've, you've, so the incredible thing here is that, let me just take you back. So this forest here with the, the kind of hardwoods, three-year-olds, and these trees are maybe two, three meters, and a lot of them are dying and they're still struggling with the grass. And then look at this with this balsa experiment. And now Maria is basically walking in a forest of trees that are almost maybe like eight nine meters high yeah. and it's it looks completely different it does so the balsa the pioneer species that it is it grows super fast but it also sheds uh, leaves very quickly those are huge leaves uh -huh. can you it show us one of those huge leaves and uh -huh. so this really resembles the ground of the forest it has a lot of yeah, just yeah. leaves decomposing. Let me have a look at this. Uh, let's get in here. So, like, instead of that grass, now look at this. Now we got this big, nice, leafy mulch material, delicious for uh, for insects and little critters. And look at the size of them; they're enormous. So these are the same age as those little straggly trees that we just saw out there. Absolutely enormous. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about like what's uh, what's the goal in this kind of experiment then? So what do you expect to change now that you see there's a shade structure and we've got lots of leaf mulch and the grass is gone? What's the what are the other benefits here? Well, it, the, one of the main benefits is that it kills the grass, so we don't have to spend like six six months every year cutting the grass. Uh, and also, it also makes it cheaper, so it's more accessible for everyone to do restoration in the tropics. And uh, about the leaves that we were mentioning, uh, and now other other species that come. In... Okay, it looks like we may have lost them for a moment. Um, they are in a pretty remote area, um, so we're just gonna have to wait a second to for them to come back in. Uh, and join us, but that was that's pretty impressive. The you know the difference between those two plots, one where they kind of planted right away those bigger species, um, and you can see how it's struggling uh, with the grasses and, and the competition, and yet right next door in a different plot where they did the pioneer species, so the species that would normally um, you know get a foothold first. You can see that difference in in, in three years, uh, how much larger that forest was, how much clearer. Um, you know, the ground was of, of grass and how that layer of nutrient rich kind of soil was building up as the leaves uh, fall down and, and decay. So that's that's pretty darn impressive. Uh, we'll just give them a second uh, to see if they can come back in and join us. Maybe they hit a wrong button uh, or maybe they're just in a, an area where they lost signal, but it looks like they're back. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, we lost you. That's OK. Right. You're back now. All right, so what we were just about to look at then is um, Maria was telling me about um, how in these big balsa trees now, because we've got this amazing canopy, she sees spider monkeys and squirrel monkeys coming back into this forest because the trees are already tall enough, and then they're pooping out the seeds of other species from the rainforest. So even though we've just planted balsas here, 
These are uh, Inga trees, which are uh, dispersed by spider monkeys and capitans and squirrel monkeys. So now we've got this natural regeneration of other rainforest trees coming underneath these balsas. So this is quite incredible. Um, so essentially what you're doing here is figuring out a way to restore rainforests and speed up that recovery process, right? Exactly. We can develop a tool for other people to use it. And we can big well forests faster and more efficient. Excellent. It's very cool. And it's amazing just to be like walking in. And you remember that field I was in that was still a cattle pasture from seven years ago. And now I'm hiking around in a, in a forest again with leaves on the ground and new rainforest trees coming up. And it's been a big change. Maria, what are these tags that I can see? So there's like some numbers and some of the tips the like this is number 941 what is this oh we use, it. we use different types of tags this one is for an arboretum we are trying to create in the earth conservation uh, property and uh, so we basically put numbers on them so we can have a nice database with all the information regarding the trees but we also use tags to keep uh, the monitoring of the growth so i can come each year and measure the same trees exactly and we can know exactly how it is doing in each of the treatments with the balsa trees and without the balsa trees. So we can know what's the effect of this kind of the balsa trees. And so you're measuring whether they're alive, how big and how fast they're exactly. growing, how much carbon is being sucked up out of the ground. Yeah, all of that. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much, Maria Jose. We're going to get more questions from Maria Jose after, hopefully. Um, and then I'm going to join. Hilary Brumberg, who's doing something weird with this long uh, yellow kind of probe. Um, and Hilary um, coordinates a lot of our rewilding and restoration program. And uh, so could you tell us what it, on earth you're doing? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us out on this lovely morning. I am monitoring one of these bird boxes that we installed. It's one of the rewilding elements that we've added to our project. Um, so rewilding is really, really important because while planting trees is a great step to regenerating a rainforest, we also need to bring back all of the other parts of the rainforest, such as wildlife and um, all the different ecosystems they bring, like colonization and mm -hmm. So this bird box is one of the rewilding elements that we've added. And the idea here is that we're trying to attract birds to give them habitat, but also to bring them in so that they, they disperse more seeds and plant more trees and also plant the trees. So why do you need to add in bird boxes? Why don't bird, why don't their birds just make nests in, in the balsa trees here? Yeah, great question. So it can take decades for the trees to get big enough to have empty cavities like this. Um, so that way birds will place their nests. So what we're trying to do is similar to planting the balsa trees, they're fast growing. We're also trying to speed up the regeneration of these empty cavities um, in order to attract these birds to place their nests. Okay. So what we have here is something really exciting. Cool. Um, so this big um, funky wire is part of an endoscope. Can I have a look at yeah. it? This is weird. And it's got a little LED light. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm going to point it. It's like flashing away. It's super cool. And so what is this? This is a ca I presume there's a camera on there. Yeah, it's a tiny little camera. Oh, I can see my face. <laughs> So it's, it's hooked up to, to my iPhone. Oh. And so whatever that little camera by the LED light is looking at, I can see on the screen of my iPhone. That's super and, cool. And, and are so they connected through Bluetooth? It's, yeah, through, through Wi-Fi. Huh. Um, so this, the endoscope has Wi-Fi. And so this is a really great way for us to see who's living in this bird box without disturbing them too much. Because we want to let them um, still, still live their life. We also need to collect data right. in order to affect them. So you're having a look in the box and the idea is I'm going to come around the back so we can kind of, can we see on that screen there? So there is a nest in there. Yeah, so it's a house wren nest, which is an adorable little brown bird. Um, and so this bird was, was living here uh, last year. And so there's a dedicated mom that was flying all over the forest, collecting these little sticks that you see here and then placing them in this bird box. Nest. Okay, so it looks like are you kind of checking now to see if there's any recurrent use or 
whether you need to kind of clean this out, like, I, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's exactly yeah. what we do. So our team goes pretty regularly every few months to check all of the hundreds of bird boxes that we have installed in our rewild box. And we have different sizes of bird boxes as well in order to attract different types. Yeah, I can birds. see some of the other ones. So there's some over there. There's another one over there. And they're all kind of different sizes. And what about this? So, like, there's a big, I'm going to try and show you guys. There's a big pile of logs on the <laughs> ground. Um, is this anything kind of interesting? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, this is another one of our wild groups. It is typically uh, intended to attract insects and frogs, snakes. And the idea here is that all of those animals live under dead hangs of wood, but it can take decades for trees to get big enough for them to naturally fall over or for them to drop their branches. And so what we're trying to do here is uh, make the, that wildlife have homes faster. And so we literally just went to our, our wood shop and collected all the pieces of scrap wood and then put it here in different piles. And we're already seeing that snakes and frogs and all sorts of critters um, including there was a, a slug hanging out in here earlier today, um, and I saw a frog in here yesterday. Um, so it's it's all about creating microhabitat, right? That exactly. these animals wouldn't have. So it's thinking beyond a rainforest, creating the microhabitat for, for species that otherwise wouldn't have a home. Exactly. Fantastic. Um, and not only having those species, but all the other species. They'll help um, all of the other. Um, it'll help with the quality of the soil and how all the other all right but what i really want to see is it looks like the hillary's kind of built herself some sort of little house over in the middle <laughs> of this plot over here yeah perfect place for me to live in <laughs> maybe let's have a look so let me show you guys so you can see what i'm i'm kind of looking at so look there's this weird kind of house in the middle of the forest over there and it looks pretty elaborate. I mean, Hillary, can you go and stand over there and show these guys how big this is? So in the middle of this like uh, tree restoration plot, Hillary's got a little holiday home over here. So tell me about this thing. Yeah, so this is the bat house. And the idea here is that it takes hundreds of years for, tree, for trees to grow large enough and then hollow out in order for bats to be able and we don't have hundreds of years to wait because that's a really important part of the ecosystem. They're key for, for pollination, for dispersing seeds, and also controlling population of insects. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done here is mimic um, an empty cavity from a natural forest and place it here in our restaurant. Yeah. So this is, uh, I remember like reading about this, um, this concept a few years ago, and it was actually a really innovative team of... Um, Costa Rican researchers, um, uh, a, a, a biologist called Gloriana Chaveri at the University of Costa Rica, who was pioneering this idea of building these big bat roosts and big bat cavities. And so um, based on her amazing research, we're now implementing that at scale and building more and more of these. How many? We've got over 20 of these things, I think, now uh, around our restoration forest. You can see we're doing some monitoring with camera traps there, but what I really want to know is what's inside. <laughs> so I can kind of see there there's a bunch of there's a bunch of poo and stuff. So this is clearly working. Yeah, should we sneak around back? Let's yeah, look. let's have a look. This is pretty nice. Yeah. I wouldn't mind living in here. So it's got a neat door on the back. Is that this is just so that you can get in there and have a look and see what's going on, right? Exactly. Do you want to pop? Yeah. Uh, in there and show these guys. Do I want to get in there? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it smells a bit funky. All right. So how do we? What am I going to do? Just point this thing up. Yes. All exactly. right. Okay. I'm gonna give you some light. Oh, okay. See, there's there's someone. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. So this is just a little. There's just a couple in there. I'm gonna mm -hmm. pop my head in and have a look. So how many? It looks like a little clump. Yeah, there's that little black speck that you all see. It could be six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's huddling together. It looks like it's about nine or ten. Oh, wow. oh 
There we go. I don't want to disturb one too much. Okay. By, by flapping around. <laughs> you can let that rest. All right, cool. And look at all that. Uh, this is what I want to point out. Like, look at all that feces in there. And it smells like really funky, but this is amazing. <laughs> so there's like insect wings and, and bugs and all sorts of stuff in there. Lots of nutrients. And it looks like there's some big feces in there as well. That's that's not bad. There must be something else going out, hanging out. And mm -hmm. hiding. That's quite amazing. Cool. So what else? Like we've got bird boxes. We've got log piles for snakes and frogs. We've got a giant bat house. <laughs> We've got trees for the monkeys to climb around in. What else have you got? Yeah, we've added a few other rewilding <laughs> elements, as if that isn't already enough. So one of them, there are these little bromeliads right here. Uh -huh. um, and these will grow usually in natural ma mature forest. And they're really important because they have this tiny little tank, almost like a little cup. And so when it rains, like it's been doing a lot here lately, um, it'll fill up with water. And then frogs and insects will lay their eggs. Well, it's like a mini ecosystem. I can actually see a bunch of mo mosquitoes and spiders and all sorts of things hanging around that. Exactly. And they'll usually come later on when the forest is a little bit more mature. But we've translocated them here right now in order to kickstart all, all that little ecosystem back. So trying to speed things up all the time. Exactly. Um, and another rewilding element that we added is these are plants that have delicious flowers and fruits that we know that wildlife love to eat. Mm -hmm. um, and the goal is to bring as much wildlife as possible. And that includes one of my favorite fruits, the banana. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I see. So there's the bananas right at the yeah. top. Yeah, and you can see someone's been, someone's been munching at it. And you can also see down here, it looks like someone had a, a really delicious snack. Uh-huh. Uh, and someone was even munching on the flower of the banana. So you're like so. In in addition to the trees, we're now thinking about food for the animals. So like putting some fruits in there. I'm uh, it's starting to rain a little bit, but we'll let's let's keep plugging along until it gets really wet. <laughs> Sounds good. And this is another one of the uh, plants uh, that we plan to bring back wildlife. This is a Panama hat. And what's pretty cool is that we're hiking earlier uh, earlier this week. And we found that some of the some of the seeds and stems were, were torn out of the the plant. And then we remembered that one of our coworkers earlier this week has seen uh, colored peccary. And so we think that the colored peccary were trampling through the spot and decided that they wanted to have a snack and play around in our in our uh pond. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to see the wildlife already engaged. These are, these are great, not only for the peccaries as well, but some of the bat species will actually make these into little tents. So mm -hmm. they'll arrive here and they kind of bent like they, they bite at the leaves, chew them and fold them over and make a little tent. So when it's raining like this, they've got a nice little safe spot. But they don't need to do it because they've got a beautiful luxury hotel <laughs> over there. So. Exactly. All right, well, that's amazing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my way around and uh, see... Marvin, but thanks, Thank Hillary. You. If you can come and see us at the end so you can do some questions with us, that'd be fantastic. All right. So all right. Andy, gonna... that's pretty amazing. What a what a project. I know, right? Look at that. Like three three years ago, just a cattle pasture. And now it's uh, a forest with bats and monkeys and all those things in, in three years. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, while you're heading over to the next spot, maybe I'll work in another quick question here uh, yeah. from you two. Uh, let's see here. Do you, um, backing up a little bit through the questions, that, that tree species with the really big leaf, a lot of the, the viewers were wondering, what was that species with the huge leaf? Yeah, so this is the balsa, the, the common name that everybody knows it by is a balsa tree. So uh, I, I remember when I was a kid, uh, Joe, many, many years ago, I used to make uh, little model airplanes and they were made from balsa wood. So balsa wood is really light uh, and it's also great for building rafts. And um, so it floats really well. So this is the tree, balsa. All but right. Yeah, really right, light and floatable. 
Yeah. And then uh, what I thought was really great was that evidence of other species starting to grow because of the monkeys and the birds bringing the seeds in. So, yeah. you know, is it looking like this is the, this is the way, have the pioneer first and then let the animals bring the, the bigger species, the hardwoods and such? Absolutely. I mean, so that's a, that's a big, like, doing extra things. So everyone around the world is getting excited by planting trees, which is a great thing because that helps us to fight climate change, right? And that's the, one of the big values. But what trees we plant and where they, we plant them is huge. And we need to think about that very carefully because there have been tree planting projects in parts of the world that have been an absolute disaster. Um, and you can plant things that are not native or they can actually damage ecosystems. So what we're really interested in here is how um, we, we rebuild an ecosystem. So that's the idea of thinking about the animals and the wildlife and how we can kickstart the process. Because a tropical rainforest, Joe, is it's a really complex system, right, with interactions between animals. Oh, there's a capuchin running around on the ground. Can you guys see the capuchin? We'll go over and we'll see the capuchins. We've got to uh, take this opportunity. So look at that. Can you see him, Joe? Um, not. E oh, yeah, yeah, up in the tree. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Well, look at look right in front of us now. Just a couple of meters off the ground, there's a white face capuchin. Can you see him? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, going up the tree. Oh, wow. Another one hopping up. Very cool. Uh huh. So, how amazing is that? It's this working. was a cat. This had cows all over it uh, just uh, about seven years ago. And now we've got a tree full of um, white capuchins. Absolutely amazing. It's so cool to see. Um, and it's, it's so rewarding. Now, that's what we're saying is it's the interaction. It's between the animals and the trees. They need one another. So if you want a healthy system, you can't just have the trees back. We've got to find ways to bring the animals back as well. I'm just gonna I'm I'm gonna hide under this roof with my buddy Johan. So hey, Johan. Johan's local. He was born, grew up here, spent his whole life on the Ossa Peninsula, and he works with us on this restoration program. And Johan's particularly excited about technology, Joe. I'm just gonna show you what he's doing. So there's the camera trap at the entrance to another one of these bat houses. And what me and Johan started talking about was what else was using those bat houses? So I'm gonna, he wants to show us this video. Johan, what is uh, this gonna be in Okay, it's the resemble the camera trampa. We put a as a mess para ver la interacción entre los animales. Ajá. Y vemos un leopardos pardalis. Oh, que wow. Y ingresa a la casa, buscando Did refugio you... de las lluvias. That's amazing. Did you see that, Joe? Can we go back, Johan? Okay. Otra vez. Yeah. So that is so cool. This is a, so this is an ocelot and you can see it's raining outside. I hope you guys can see the screen. And this ocelot's looking for somewhere to hide and get out of the rain. That's amazing. How cool is that? You want to get that on your wild cat week, Joe? <laughs> Good work, Johan. So, Johan's uh, learning all about technologies. Uh, vamos a ver el uh, sí, sistema sí. acústico también. All right, so we're going to hide his laptop under that umbrella down there. So, Johan's going to show us one last piece of technology that he's using. Bye, bye, adelante. He's going to show us one last piece of technology that he's using to learn more about these plots and about the wildlife, about the health of these plots. See, yeah. los cappuccinos. Ah, look, look, another species of monkey. Now we got spider monkey in the, in the same trees. Wow. This is crazy. So this species, uh, there's a spider monkey up there. It's an endangered species. How cool. Wow. We're just surrounded in wildlife. The capuchins were on the ground. I know they were running around on the ground. Everybody's checking out the capuchins. 
So, Johan, show us what this is. Eh, también estamos haciendo la cuchara para grabar los cantos de las aves y el cuchara. Okay, so Johan's saying that this weird box that he's got strapped to the tree here is uh, an acoustic device. So it's listening to us uh, and it's recording. Eh, ¿Y por cuán, cuánto tiempo se graba? ¿Aquí uh, por meses o por, una semana? Eh, pues por tres meses se graba 24 horas. Oh, Wow, so it's out here for three months and it's recording all of the time. And this is a microphone. So I'm going to show you how this works. It's all in a dry case, but there's a microphone just where Johan's pointing to under there. And this is listening to the sounds of the rainforest uh, and, and the sounds of what's happening in these restoration plots. So the calls of those monkeys, the calls of the birds, even the calls of the insects. So this project is a big collaboration with National Geographic uh, Labs team, Joel, and uh, the Cornell Lab uh, for Ornithology. And we're gathering all this data about how the sounds of these different restoration um, plots actually changes over time. So we can listen to all those uh, incredible animals. It's another way of understanding how these plots are, are changing. And you can also see, Johan, mira, look at all the, the claw marks. So these are like uh, the coates and the capuchins going up and down the trees. We can see the signs and the tracks of the animals as well. So, so Joe, that gives you a little taste. Like I've introduced you to three of our very dedicated team members who are planting trees, trying to understand the different strategies to regrow forests, and then going so much deeper to try and figure out how to bring the wildlife back into those forests. And then use technology like these acoustic devices and the camera traps to actually monitor and understand what's going on. So um, maybe we want to take some questions and I've got the whole team here with me. Um, so everybody's happy to answer questions. All right. Well, first of all, huge shout out to the whole team, well, Andy. You're a lucky guy. How can we turn it up? I can't hear him. Sorry, Joe. We're having trouble listening to you. That's OK. Cool. How about now? Is that better? Right. No, I All can't right. hear you very well. Could be our microphones got wet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my ear to the microphone. Okay. Well, I was going to say a huge shout out to your team. Uh, thank you for all the great work that you do. And, and you're a lucky guy to be surrounded by that team. Uh, yeah, no, we're, we're extremely lucky. Like, and uh, these... You know, it's tough uh, being in this environment and uh, spending all this time in the field. But when uh, I think when you see, you know, when you see monkeys uh, walking around around you uh, in your in your office every day, it's, it's pretty rewarding. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's turn the students loose. Let's start with Miss Langer's group uh, in uh, Coburg, Ontario. I'm going to bring them uh, into the call. All right. Hey, Mrs. Langer. Let's Hi everyone. The behind us. So first of all, I just want to extend my my. This was an amazing presentation. I've been to lots, and this was great. I gave uh I brought the question about at the beginning about where are all the animals, and then of course we saw some of them. We were so privileged, but we're wondering now if uh, the animals are coming in despite the fact that there's human activity, or will more animals come in once humans leave the area? Okay, okay, I got the question. I, I could hear that. So I'm just going to relay it to the team. So the question is, um, like, with human activity, um, being in this area and people being around, will animals keep coming and we will still see more animals coming with with people being around? Well, I, 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 I think... Um, Look, from what I've seen uh, in, in research so far and, and working and living with, with wildlife and in, in this field is that actually if we don't kill animals and we don't hunt animals, um, we can live side by side pretty well with them. And uh, we've seen lots of cases in urban environments uh, like where I'm from with, with foxes. I've seen monkeys living in cities in Brazil. Um, and we've seen places, especially with what's happened with the pandemic, right, where animals come right back into our urban environments. 
So they're actually very tolerant and they're willing to live alongside us. Um, and I would say the most important thing is that it, it's about how we kind of, um, how we interact. And you can see those capuchins over there. They're literally like seven meters from us and they're wandering around on the ground. And they wouldn't do that with any kind of typical predator that they were scared of. Um, they would be way away. So these captains don't see any of our team as a threat. We're just another part of the natural ecosystem. So I think if we interact with nature in the right way, I think it's going to recover all around us. We just got to learn to learn to live alongside it. The microphone just got wet. Very cool. I'm going to bring in uh, Mrs. A's group, a grade one class who's joining us virtually. How are you doing today? Hi. Hey, All right. I can just uh, hear you. <laughs> perfect. Mrs. Hi. A, do you have a question from your group? We did. I had a question from Chase wanted to know what everybody's favorite part of the rainforest is. All right. So what's everybody's favorite part of the rainforest? All right. So we'll start with Hillary and then we'll go around. ¿Cuál es su favorita parte del bosque? We'll start with Hillary. Wow. That's a good question. I love the, the river um, because they, they connect all the parts of the rainforest, the highlands and the mountains, all the way down through the lowlands and into, into the ocean. So they're a really good way. Um, in order to show the interaction between the different parts of the rainforest. And also when you look at them, it just looks like there's water flowing, but below uh, the surface of the water, there's a whole nother ecosystem. A lot of, a lot of really exciting life. All right, so Hillary votes for rivers. Johan, ¿cuál es su favorita parte del bosque? Oh, eh, cuando voy caminando en Mario o en Cielos, y observo huellas o all right i love that answer that's very cool so johan what he says he really loves is when he goes in the primary forest and then he's working in these restoration areas and he sees the footprints and the tracks of uh, the wildlife like the ocelot and like tapirs and he kind of sees that recovery of the species coming from the primary forest back into the areas that he's working in for restoration that's a very cool answer uh, maria jose and mine is when i'm walking in a very old growth forest and i find a giant tree and it has like giant buttresses and everything because it itself it's like a whole ecosystem and you can find like in the super far in the canopy, giant birds also. Uh, but every part of that tree is in itself holding life. So that's magic. I love giant trees. <laughs> okay. I like questions like this because um, it's so easy for us. Um, <laughs> it's hard to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to pick one. Um, mine, I, I think mine is uh, when I'm like hiking. Um, and I get surprised by a snake. I love snakes. I've always loved snakes since I was a little kid. And I still get just as excited when, I, when a, a snake surprises me in the forest and, uh, you know, jumps out. So I'm, I'm snake nuts. So that's my favorite part. I had the worst answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, but, Mr. Well, it looks like you are question, so. on the move. But can you hear me, Mr. Zipper? Yes, I can. Sorry, I'm switching classes. <laughs> That's okay. Did they have one that we can answer? They can check out the recording? Yeah, um, I feel like I can ask a question from in here. Um, they were wondering what, um, like, how many acres are they trying to restore um, in a year? Like, what's their goal in terms okay. of size? Yeah, so, all right, that's a great question. 
So I think in hectares, uh, not acres, someone do a quick calculation for me. Is it like more or less? It's like more or less double. So um, thinking in hectares, this experiment in itself isn't that big. Um, it's like 20 hectares, right? Um, so it's not that huge, which is about 40 acres. So the experiment that generates the, the data and the knowledge isn't that huge. Um, but over the past seven years, I think Hillary just did a calculation and it came to about 350,000 trees. So 350,000 trees that we have uh, roughly planted over the last seven years. Um, and that's around 1,600 per hectare, no less, trees, or 1,200. Yeah, yeah. So 1,200. Okay, so yeah, it's, it's a big area, but uh, typically, what we'll end up doing is our, uh, an annual average. Um, how many? Well, trees, let's say this year we did around um, 18,000 trees, I think, which is, so that's just around 15 hectares, um, which is about 30 acres. But what we'd love to do, and Hillary's been doing a lot of work on this with, with NASA Develop Program and other partners, is calculating what's the potential and what's the opportunity to plant trees in the corridors that connect the national park. So you could maybe tell us a little bit about that and how many trees you reckon could uh, connect the national parks down here. Yeah, absolutely. So while there's been incredible conservation success in the Osa Peninsula, we're now thinking about expanding our work to next largest forest, which is in La Amistad International. And so there's a biological corridor that connects uh, the Osas National Park with the National Park um, up in the, the mountains of Stad. And we think that it'll take about 1 million trees in order to reforest all of the, the areas next to rivers um, in that biological corridor. And why are we focusing on rivers? Because that's where we get more bang for our buck in terms of restoration. So as Maria Jose and Andy were talking at the beginning, Restoration can take a long time and be pretty expensive. And so we're focusing on rivers in these biological borders because that's an area where we're not only are we providing habitat for wildlife to move between the national parks, but also protect the water quality, which is really, really important for all the animals that um, bathe in the water and live in the water, but also for the local community that live in the area. Cool. All right, let's take a little trip to Mrs. Nagy's grade five sixes. I'm going to bring them in. How are we doing, five sixes? Good. Can you hear us? We can hear yeah. you. Yeah, loud. you guys. All right, Ella's going to be coming up and asking a question. Yeah. By rebuilding the rainforest by humans, is there any risk to introduce an invasive species to the forest? All right, I think we just about heard that question. So that was about, are there any introduced and invasive species in the rainforest? Is that right? Yeah. Is there, there any risk to introducing an invasive species because it's being rebuilt by humans? Ah, okay, okay. So that's a really great question. Really, really good. Um, so what's the risk if we try and rebuild and regrow rainforest to bring in introduced species? So who wants to take that question? Well, I'm going to get us started whilst these guys come up with a really smart answer. Um, you, you, you're completely right. I mean, um, the, the challenge is, is we're, we actually don't know what kind of system that we're going to end up with. And the first thing is a lot of the grasses that we're, we're, we've got to deal with, they're actually introduced species. Some of those grasses were brought in from Africa to feed the cows and they're very aggressive so that's why it's particularly difficult to get get rid of them they're really thick they're very dense and they're very established um what i i, I would say from what i've seen of restoration here that's uh that's the biggest problem is often not an introduced species but sometimes very aggressive native species can become dominant and can take over so there's a particular vine here uh, that's a native species, it's not introduced, um, but sometimes with very poor soils and lots of sun, it completely takes over and it's like a liana and a vine. So it just engulfs all of the trees and it kind of pulls them down and causes them to collapse. 
and that's quite problematic. In some of the upland areas, um, there's a native species of fern that completely takes over and it's hard for the trees to establish themselves. And those are actually really good cases where we need active restoration and we need people to go in and help uh, maybe move that system along. Maybe we need to go in and control some of those ferns, go and control some of those lianas and give the trees uh, a chance to establish. In terms of non-native trees, um, we don't have a, a huge problem um, that I'm aware of. Rainforests are pretty typically dense, but it's more so in, in open areas, right? Where you've got these very generalist and adaptable um, species that kind of take a hold. Yeah. Anything else? So when, we're planning, so when we're planning a restoration project like this, we want to make sure that we're planting the right species of trees and adding the right rewilding elements in order to mimic the forest that used to be here based on the native flora and fauna. So what we do is we go out and hike into the old growth forest, like where Maria Jose says that she looks for those giant trees. And we look around and find out what all the trees are that live in that area. And those are the trees that we then collect the seeds and grow in our greenhouse and plant in the nearby forest in order to restore it. And we make sure we get a native forest. And I, I think, Joe, it's worth pointing out, you've been with us on a few um, of these events before, and we've been with some of the botanists like Marvin and Ruth, who go out and look for those rare trees, those endangered trees. And all of that is incorporated into our restoration program. These guys are all one big team and family, and they're always thinking and working together about how they're going uh, to rebuild um, forest ecosystems. All right. Oh, so amazing. I'm going to bring in uh, Mr. Tunnard here. His class is in uh, Oshawa. How are we doing I'm today? Good. How are you? Uh, we really, good. We really appreciate this. This is a, a great presentation. Um, we have a few questions, but I, I guess our sort of the, the main focus for us really is the we look at some of those animals, the the spider monkeys and that that were are endangered. Um, is there anything specific that you have to do in terms of limiting like predators or, or causes for them to, and in ways to protect them to kind of increase their numbers? Okay, cool. Um, all right. So the question there was about um, some of these endangered species, like what can we do to, to boost their populations and, and maybe stop predation and, and how we help the wildlife. Um, so I think with um, particular species like uh, the spider monkey, for example, let, let, let's take a couple of the threatened species here on the peninsula. Um, the spider monkey, maybe some of the peccaries that Hillary mentioned, um, the white lip peccaries in particular, they're often targets for hunters. And so if we really want to see the populations boosted, we need to do more than just rebuild habitat, right? Um, we've got to change the the way that people like connect to wildlife and think about wildlife. So, so it's a great question. And, and we're constantly thinking about this is how do we, how do we work with people to appreciate nature, to value nature in a different way um, and to really uh, shift uh, some, some level of cultural change away from traditional hunting practices, because some of the species that we're talking about, they just can't sustain um, the, the levels of, of, of hunting and pressure on them. So that's why our work actually that, that Hillary was touching upon of, of working with landowners, working to restore and rebuild those systems and also to work with them about um, appreciating that wildlife and um, actually wanting that wildlife back in the systems. It gets way more complicated when we think about something like carnivores, right? Um, with with conflict issues with with jaguars, for example. And there are programs in Costa Rica where farmers can get uh, compensated if they have a livestock uh, predation event and a, a jaguar would take one of the cows. There are mechanisms by which that farmer can be compensated for the loss of that that animal. And so there are 
ways in which um, conservationists try and reduce those those pressures and those conflict areas, but it's 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 quite challenging. Uh, a good uh, friend of mine and uh, one of our board members, Esteban, works on a program here with tapirs in Costa Rica, and um, has worked over the last 10 years to completely change the way that people feel and think about tapirs. And there's now farmers that are very proud of having tapirs in their landscape, as opposed to uh, wanting to get rid of them because they're, they're feeding on the crops and, and, and the past. So I think for those particularly endangered species that come into contact with people, it's about working with, with people. All right. Well, Andy, uh, you know, I have to say these events just keep getting better and better. Thank you uh, to your whole team today, Mary Jose, uh, Johan and Hillary. Absolutely incredible. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for showcasing this incredible work uh, to all these students across North America today. Hundreds and hundreds of students tuning in live. Um, and thanks for braving the rain. I know it started up uh, everybody's looking like they're getting a little bit wet out there. So thank you so much uh, for today. Uh, events with OSA are just absolutely incredible. The work you're doing, being able to highlight it is a real treat. Uh, it's our pleasure, Joe. Um, so yeah, um, I'm trying to get everybody in shot, but um, it's our pleasure. And uh, we love sharing this work, right? You know, we don't, we don't do it for us. Uh, we're trying to do it to get the message out there, to get knowledge. And thank you for giving us a platform that we can share what we're doing with people. And uh, hopefully uh, you can come and hang out and come and see this stuff uh, for real, hopefully in 2021. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much. We can't wait for our next trip uh, down to the Osa Peninsula. Uh, thanks to the team. Go get, go get dry. And uh, wow, what just such great conservation work in action a real highlight for all of our classrooms today. Awesome, and thanks for the great questions, everyone. All right, have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much, everyone.